Julius Caesar needed to beware the Ides of March, but you don't, because here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, it's episode release day. And this week, we explore the, well, arguably unglamorous, but undeniably important role air traffic control plays around aircraft carriers operating at sea. And our guest, well, I'm no betting man, but I'm willing to wager many of you will recognize her. I still get it to this day that many years later, people will come up and say, are you that girl from Carrier? <laughs> Hold overhead, Mother Angel. 300, read back, Clock 7145. 412, departure, radar contact. Power. Easy with it now. Easy with it. Easy with it. Easy with it. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. So that voice you heard in the intro, it belongs to my good friend, Katsy Sue, who I just know you are going to love. Our discussion on carrier air traffic control operations, equipment, and the people involved is coming up in just a few minutes. But first, hello. You found episode 135 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, and I am your host, Jello. I hope you're doing as well as possible on this ever turbulent rock upon which we are spinning through the universe. Man, I tell you what, wars, rumors of wars, sky high inflation, record high gas prices. It's an ugly situation out there, but at least you have this podcast to take you away from it all for an hour and change every 10 days. And I'm glad to do my part. Well, let's see. Last week's Flight Test Engineers episode was a big success, I thought. And many of you responded favorably to more episodes with Ken Katz. So we'll look to do that on occasion in the future. And then five days later, on March 10th, we released a bonus episode updating everyone on the Gripen E, since it's been two years since we featured the JAS-39 on episode 68. And I hope everyone caught and enjoyed that relatively short discussion. And my thanks to Saab AB for sponsoring me to say so. And then finally, as an update from Boat, in case you've been wondering where he's been lately, he sent me this message for all of you, so take a listen. Hey everyone, it's Boat. And I wanted to step in for just a second and explain where I've been the last month or so, and frankly, what the near future holds going forward. Now, I've got a bunch of stuff going on in the background of my life right now, and similar to Sunshine, my life has been getting a little overwhelming while trying to balance the stressors of jobs and kids and, well, just life. And as such, I've not been able to devote as much time to the show as is necessary to meet the standards we expect, nor the production timeline needed to air episodes every 10 days. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm going to take a step back from participating in the podcast and producing new episodes to focus on my life and really just regroup. I hope to be back sooner rather than later, but I just don't have a good time estimate for that right now. But that being said, I did want to thank all of you for the support over the last couple of years with me behind the microphone, and it's just really been a real honor getting to be part of everything. I'll be listening to the show like you all are, and as I like to say, get high, get fast, and do some good work. I'll see you all later. All right, Bo. Well, on behalf of all the listeners, thanks for everything you've done for the show. Man, take care of yourself and the important things now. And later, if the time is right, we'll all be happy to welcome you back to the show. Best wishes, my friend, and let me know how I can help. All right, just a couple listener questions then before we get to the feature interview. The first is an email from Michael Youngblood from Austin, Texas. And I am paraphrasing Michael's email here. He says, aircraft carrier shooters seem to have similar stances, but it's not a particularly natural stance. Where did it come from, parentheses, other than the need to touch the deck as a signal and be low in general for safety during the shot? Well, Michael, I was never a shooter, so I asked a fellow UCLA alumnus, Ed McCabe, a good friend of mine who was, and he says it is absolutely about style. As discussed, the need to get down low and touch the deck is important, but as with anything, there is a coolness factor involved. I always wanted to exaggerate the motions to show my sailors I loved it and was completely in control, but still had to look cool for the air wing bubbas because they would razz me later in the dirty shirt if I didn't. That's just the name of the wardroom upstairs where you can get some food later. Ed continues, sometimes there is a healthy headwind, so that's part of it too, plus bracing yourself for the occasional jet blast You wouldn't want to lose your balance. And he says, I haven't thought about this since training back at Lakehurst in forever. It was 24 years ago, but I'm sure they demonstrated the style for all of us shooter wannabes. Dude, this makes me smile. 
Great memories. <laughs> well, Michael, you gave at least one old timer like me a trip down memory lane, and I hope that helps. All right, the next email is from Levi from Germany, and it comes in multiple parts. I'll answer them accordingly. How do you confirm air-to-air kills and air-to-ground shacks? Well, Levi, you've got two situations there. In training, we have air-to-air kill criteria, as we call it, and you assess it real time and you make a call over the radio. And when you get back, you debrief it. And if you're right, great. If you're wrong, you're probably going to have to pay five bucks and do better next time. And the money just goes into the pot for something you're doing socially later, probably. And then for air to ground, of course, you've got the good old eyeballs to take a look, or some ranges will actually have scoring and can tell you how far and at what clock code from the bullseye that you missed. And then in combat, as we've discussed before on the show, there is, again, visual or electronic indications, or later, sometimes you might not know until Intel says, yeah, we have indications that suggest the target was destroyed or the aircraft was shot down or whatever the case might be. All right, part two of Levi's question, are there any pilots who have a hearing disability? I mean, just a bit of hearing loss that can be canceled out by hearing aids. Not that I ever knew, Levi. And then finally, just a thought, why aren't there any long or medium range air-to-air missiles that initially guide on radar and in the terminal phase with IR or TV seekers? Well, that's an interesting one, Levi. I don't know of any TV guided air-to-air missiles. And I think maybe you might consider that even the radar is not that useful at super long range on say the AIM-54 Phoenix or the AIM-120 AMRAAM. And in fact, maybe a better question is why not have data link updates to the mid-course guidance like an AIM-120 and then maybe an IR seeker at the end. And we discussed that on a recent episode. So, um, you know, I come back to, if it was a viable idea, I feel like someone would have been doing it by now. So the fact that you don't see it could suggest something and I don't know. That's just my guess. All right. That'll do it for the questions. No phone calls this week. As always, if you have a question for the show, you can submit it as you will hear on the closing bumper by our announcer, Clint, for the email or phone number to do that. All right. Now let's pivot to the feature segment, which is our discussion on carrier air traffic control with Katsy Sue. And I found the touching interview a very suitable way to wrap up the episode. So I won't be back to comment after the interview. In that case, here are a few caveats before we listen. First, you may hear, as always, a few minor misspeaks here and there, which is normal. And if it was contextually important, I would have told you as I'm about to in some of these other caveats. But for the most part, I think you can figure out when we make a minor misspeak. When we discuss air traffic control roles, we fail to mention that they also help out with weather information and avoidance, and that's important. At least around the continental U.S. and other places, not so much on the ship, that is kind of on your own or or what you get from uh, whoever you're talking to at the time. And then as far as specific carrier operations go, you will remember from episodes 11 and 12 that unlike a land-based airfield, which is almost always available for takeoffs and landings, an aircraft carrier is only open for such operations during specified times. We talked about that with Pappy during the cyclic operations, although maybe for CQ, it might be open for a long period of time. But normally when the air wing and carrier are deployed, there are only specific times you can take off and land. And it's not just at your own whim, of course. Next, when we discuss case one, two, and three procedures here in a bit, don't get confused when Sue mentions under the case three that we also have modes one, two, and three. And in fact, there's also a mode 1A we didn't talk about, which is simply the coupled approach that you click out of right at the end and land it yourself. We discuss how the base recovery course or BRC differs from the FB or the final bearing, but we didn't really specify why it matters. And it has primarily to do with how aircraft hold overhead in case one, which is relative to where the ship is sailing versus where we marshal in relation to the direction of the landing or the final bearing for case two or three, which again is about 10 degrees off because of the angled deck of our carriers. Finally, FACSFAC, as you'll hear, that stands for Fleet Area Control and Surveillance Facility, which is the scheduling and coordination agency for air, surface, and subsurface activity in our offshore ocean ranges. All right, so that's it. Let's get to the interview. And since that will do it for this episode at the end, we'll see you back here 10 days after that for another aircraft carrier discussion, that one on the 100th anniversary of U.S. Navy carriers. All right, here we go. If you watched the 2008 PBS series Carrier, particularly the Pitching Deck episodes, then you saw a very friendly redhead in the radar room rooting on the struggling pilots, 
including me at one point, actually. Well, her name is Sue Beckman, and she and other CATSI officers do a whole lot more to assist air operations around carriers at sea than simply cheerleading, as we're about to learn because she joins us today. Hello, Sue. Hi, Jello. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for joining us. I'm so happy to be here on the podcast. Great. Well, yeah, we've been talking a bit in the last couple of years. Can you believe in a couple of months it'll be 17 years since we went on that deployment? No, it still feels like yesterday. I can't believe it's been 17 years. <laughs> that was one of my favorite deployments, but I had the most experience too. But do people recognize you from the show, by the way? They do. Yeah. And I still get it to this day that many years later, people will come up and say, are you that girl from Carrier? <laughs> girl, huh? Okay. Well, plus our digital combat simulator friends all recognize your voice because you, what, play yourself? I do. <laughs> What did you do? Do you marshal or approach? And we'll get to all that. I think I did both. Oh, you did? I think so. All right. Well, let's get to know you first for those who maybe didn't see the show, but even there, I don't think we got to know you too well. Where are you from? And give us a quick synopsis of your military experiences and maybe what you're doing now. Okay. I was born in Waynesboro, Virginia, but when I was about three, my parents moved to Dalton, Georgia, which is where I spent all my life growing up and going to high school. Halfway through my senior year, my parents moved across the border into Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is where I joined the Navy at 18. Okay. I went into the Navy pretty much right after high school, right as an air traffic controller, went to boot camp in Orlando, where I'm currently living now, did air traffic control school in Tennessee from there, a couple of duty stations, Diego Garcia, Oceana, Facts Fact Bay Capes, went to NAS Jacksonville, which is where I received my commission as a 6390 air traffic control LDO officer. From there, I went to the Nimitz. Uh, Let me back up. During my enlisted time, I did have a tour on the aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy when they first started putting females on the carrier, which is where my carrier air traffic control experience started. So when I went to the carrier as the CATSI officer, I did have carrier air traffic control experience. After that, I did a tour at NOC TSD, a couple of Naval Air Stations, and I retired out of Naval Air Station Patuxent River, currently working as a project lead for an aircraft modification um, we're modifying a G4 or a C20 to be a cast glance asset for a West Coast squadron to replace an aging P3. Oh, okay. By the way, how far are you from the airport in Orlando? I lay over there all the time. Do you really? Yeah. I'm only about to 20 minutes. Oh, for some reason, I thought you were up in Pax River. Is that where you ended up? That's where I retired from. Okay. Started working as a civilian there. When my son graduated high school and I had the opportunity to come back where it's much warmer, I did that. <laughs> All right, Sue. So we're going to talk about air traffic control around the carrier, but just to set the stage, let's start with some basic air traffic control. Now, probably the listener knows this, but just in case, when I was in my final assignment in the Navy, I was flying F-18s here at North Island. When I started up, I might first talk to ground control to taxi over to the runway. Then I would switch to tower. And then I would take off with them and switch to SoCal. That was departure. And depending on what I was doing, I might talk to LA Center or the Facts Fact people. Uh, Beaver was their call sign. And then on the way back, it would be the reverse, except instead of departure, it'd be approach. So these are folks that I'm talking to, kind of watching over me. But with that in mind, for shore-based operations, what's kind of the overall goal or purpose of air traffic control? The purpose of air traffic control in a simple answer is just to safely keep the aircraft separated as they move between airports. We provide safe, expeditious, orderly flow of all the air traffic. Now, in cars, right, we don't have something like that, and we occasionally bump into each other, but airplanes, either because it's fewer airplanes or more catastrophic when it happens, we have a system that basically says, all right, you go at this altitude in this heading, and you go at this altitude of that heading, and then you won't bump into each other. Yes. Okay. But it's not just collision. It's also, like you said, if if we had everybody, just every man for himself, it would probably get really congested. But if we have a system in place, like I've been to Newark, I don't know if you've been any super busy airports, but I think we were like number 27 in line to take off one time. This was in my airline capacity. It was brutal because we sat there for over 30 minutes. But on the other hand, it was as efficient as it could be. So air traffic controls also to just kind of keep things flowing in an orderly manner. That's correct. That's what we provide. Everything is timed and it's orderly. If everybody was converging in on Atlanta airport at one time, that would be very dangerous. So the controllers are there to make sure that everybody gets in orderly as quickly as possible. They're 
very understanding of the time sensitivity of airlines, especially. They put people in holding to help reduce that congestion as much as possible, separate via altitudes, lots of different tricks you can use to help keep everybody apart, but yet still keep things flowing. So then dumb question, which I'm full of, why do we need that at an aircraft carrier at sea? The easiest way to explain it is it's no different than a land-based airport, except that your runway is moving. But we're all on the same team, right? So couldn't we all just uh, have a common frequency? But again, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, right? So there are times where it gets very congested, even around a carrier. It does. Everybody's coming back at the same time because you leave at the same time, you know, basically 30 to 60 seconds apart, and you come back at the exact same time. So when a group is leaving a group of aircraft, whether it be nine in a sortie or 16, they're leaving for their missions, they have to come back and they have to leave. So somebody has to be there to provide that orderly arrival and departure. Gotcha. So way back on episodes, I think it was 13 and 14, we talked about day carrier operations here on the show. And then 15 was night carrier operations. And so hopefully the listener remembers that we have case one, two, and three procedures. And Sue, what I thought we could do just for fun is kind of talk through each one of those. You could enlighten us on what the ship's air traffic control is doing during those operations. Does that work? That works. Okay. Now, before we do that, we think of an aircraft carrier as a warship, obviously. Are you part of that or are you more of an administrative function for, again, the safe and expeditious recovery of aircraft? Do you have any sort of military role? And maybe that's a dumb way to put it, but you get what I'm saying? Because there's other agencies that are using radars and talking to aircraft. Ship's defense, basically, I think is what you're getting at. Okay. When CATSI is manned up, there is someone always sitting at the marshal scope, always looking in the carrier control area, which is out to 50 miles surface to infinity. You're looking for not just the aircraft that might be coming back, but if nobody is flying at that moment and you're just in a lull, you're still looking. You're looking for any targets that might be entering that area that do not belong to you. Okay. Even if it's a primary target without a squawk, you want to look for that and you notify folks if you see anything. And of course, that makes sense because there's only so many folks on the carrier. The consequences of getting it wrong is large and consequential, of course. And so we've got folks that are helping each other out and not keeping secrets. Okay. So just as a refresher, case one is the daytime and good weather conditions where I can launch off. Well, let's say I'm in my F-18 and you're on the ship. Using my previous example, when I talked to ground at North Island, they are helping me, again, safely taxi over the runway without going across a runway that might be getting landed on or having another aircraft that comes head to head with me because we don't back up too well, unlike cars. <laughs> but if I'm moving around on the ship, and I know this isn't necessarily your expertise, but I know you know the answer, am I talking to a ground equivalent in that case? Well, on the ship, most of the operations in case one especially are done zip lip very, very minimal communication. There's a few required voice transmissions that are needed, but in your ground capacity where you're taxiing around the flight deck, the air boss who's in the tower is who you would be talking to. Unlike shore-based air traffic control, where you have air traffic controllers in the tower conducting ground control on a carrier, that's actually the air boss who is a pilot or a naval flight officer who's qualified for those operations. Right. He also, in case one, is the one that's talking to the aircraft if transmissions need to happen while they're in the carrier control zone, which is a five-mile radius up to 2,500 feet. Okay. That's the air boss's territory. So he's not an air traffic controller like the folks that are down in CCA, which is the carrier controlled approach on the carrier. And we'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, it was a bit of a loaded question because the difference between North Island and the flight deck of Nimitz is that on Nimitz, I'm under positive control when I'm taxiing with the yellow shirts, right? And those are the aircraft directors, I think, right? And they divide up in different portions, fly one, two, and three on the ship deck. And we could talk about that another time. But the point is, I don't have to request taxi information. I just go where the yellow shirts tell us and all of that is hand signals. Even at night, we do it with wands. The point is that part, is essentially, like you said, zip lip or no communications other than verbal, unless it's needed. Hey boss, 403 is stuck in the wires. I need to come up on the power. Even that is great off the coast of Southern California, but you might not want to do 
somewhere else if you're trying to do MCON or emissions control. All right, so I take off on my case one launch. I do a clearing turn. Am I talking to you or any of your folks for departure in this case? Case one, you don't go up departure. Right. You stay with the Airbus. You fly out to about seven miles, I believe, and then you're clear to climb unrestricted at that point. And as long as you're staying VMC, you get to your departure rendezvous point where you meet up with your mission wingman, mm -hmm. if you will, for lack of a better word. And you'll rendezvous there until everyone is on station that needs to be. And then you proceed out with the combat controller or whatever ship that might be controlling you out to do your mission. Right. Which is now the operational part, not the administrative in a sense. Correct. Okay. So we have standard operating procedures as an air wing so that when I launch off, like you said, I will do a clearing turn, climb to 500 feet, accelerate to 300 knots, go to seven miles without saying a word if I don't have to. And then I can switch and start talking to other folks and go rendezvous and go on my mission. That's all fine and good going out. What about when I'm coming home on case one? When you come back on case one, you do check in with the marshal controller. CCA is manned up with a departure controller, a marshal controller, and a supervisor and a stat board operator, if you will, mm -hmm. who keeps track of all the fuel states and things like that for air ops. You'll check in with the marshal controller when you're about 50 to 60 miles out. And the marshal controller at that point will give you what the ship is heading. Base recovery course is what we call it. And that's the ship's heading. They'll give you weather at the ship, the case recovery to make sure it's still case one. And then they'll give you your land time or the time that you're supposed to be on deck. Yeah. For case one, we generally know the cycle times, right? Right. And so I think the important part of what you're saying is if the ship is going north and I come at it from the north going south, then I've got a problem. And so we all have procedures to not within about 10 miles come in at funky angles because all the aircraft are going to be holding overhead. So I talked to Marshall who kind of gives me the summary of what I need to know in order to do the rest of the procedures, essentially calm out based on visual cues with other aircraft. Correct. Okay. And then is there a civilian, if you will, equivalent of Marshall? I'm trying to think of what I could relate that to. I guess it's a bit like center. If I was off the coast operating and I come back at high altitude, I might check in with center, but maybe there's no equivalent. I don't know. It's more of your approach controller. Okay. Even though you have approach on a carrier, Marshall is more the approach controller that's pointing you towards that runway, and then they're going to hand you off to the arrival controller, who will then hand you off to your final controller. And we'll get to case three in a minute, and that most parallels that for back here at the shore. So when I talk to Marshall, Marshall will say, I think it's report see me. That means you just see the ship. And once they do, switch tower. And then once you get to tower, you don't have to talk to them, unlike at a regulated airfield in the States. You just check in, you find your interval, you've got procedures, you collapse the stack. Hopefully everybody comes down and lands. And I don't know about you, Sue, I've actually seen this word. You never hear a single word. I mean, you might hear an occasional right for lineup or power from the LSOs if it's needed, but otherwise it's all calm out. And when that's working well, that's a sight to see. It is. It's amazing how well it's orchestrated. Yeah. It's a synchronized swimming. It just happens. <laughs> There's no talking. Nobody's telling you what to do. It just magically happens. Pilots make it back for their Charlie time on time. It's all very precision timed. As you know, in Catsy, we give a lot of time hacks, a lot of time checks, mm -hmm. always making sure that everybody's clock is in sync so that it can happen that way. You're not talking since it's all timed perfectly. And I wonder, Sue, is that a relic of old times? Because even during my career, GPS became pretty ubiquitous and it was rare to not have a good GPS time hack. Do you think they're still doing that out there? Do you have friends that are out there still doing that? They do still do it. <laughs> they do still have friends that are out there and they still do old school. Hey, it works. It works. Yeah. All right. So, so in our scenario here, let's change the parameters. Now let's say there is a what 2000 foot solid overcast because for case one, we've got this stack. Think of a funnel in a sense, or more of a cylinder directly overhead the ship where all these aircraft are holding at two, three, 4,000 feet. But if there's clouds in the middle of that, and now we can't do it, calm out. Now we're going to go to case two, but let's start with the launch. So the deck procedures are the same. The actual launch is the same. 
until I get to seven miles, then I want to start climbing. And then now I'm going to touch some clouds. So am I going to do anything different here? Or if I just get on my squadron's safety radial, should I be okay? You do. On case two, you will depart on button two, which is the department for frequency. Mm-hmm. On the carrier in that environment, they like to do what's called calm brevity. So on shore air traffic control, you would read out the entire frequency, 117.8. But on a carrier, you use just buttons for each position. So you'll launch on button two, you'll call airborne, you proceed out to seven miles, like you said. At that point, that's where you're going to turn to intercept your 10-mile arc to your established departure radial, which is established by air wing doctrine. Mm-hmm. It's either by squadron or mission. I can't remember exactly. It's by squadron, yeah. You've got the departure radio where you'll go out there in rendezvous between 20 and 50 miles of the ship or from mom, as we call her, or from mother. That's right. Um, at that point, you have to report passing flight level 180 because you're clear to climb at that point when you're on your 10 mile arc. You have to report clear at flight level 180. If not, you have to report Popeye that you still can't see. At that point, the departure controller would assign each aircraft an altitude starting at flight level 190. So if you're in 410, you would get 190, 408 would get flight level 200. <laughs> 200, yes. Yeah. Word of math, can't count. <laughs> That's all right. You've been out of it for a couple of years, so we'll give you a pass. I have. I started thinking about it the last time I was on a carrier was 2008. Oh, wow. So when I was preparing and thinking about how long it's been, I was like, <laughs> wow, I think I'm still pretty sharp for it having been so long. But yeah. Carrier traffic control has not changed really throughout the years. When I was an enlisted controller on the Kennedy, these same procedures were there, maybe with minor tweaks. Mm -hmm. So unlike having to learn everything different at a shore-based airport or a shore-based center, every place is different. It's the same on each carrier. That's true. And that's a good thing for the folks doing the work because they don't have to learn something new every time. So, all right. So just to go back to a couple of things you said, number one, sorry to correct you, but for the sake of the listener, so we have octal IFF systems. So generally we won't have a 408, right? We'll have 405, 6, 7, and then 10. We'll skip eight and nine, but also the departure reference radial. Yeah. I forgot about that. For example, if my squadron is plus 40 and we launch due north, then I would arc over to the 040 radial, and then I'd head outbound. But let's say we take off heading east, then 090 plus 40 is I'd go out on the 130. So it's all relative. And the point again being, while normally we like to use our eyeballs, in this case, if we've got weather that impede that, well, we need to have procedures in place so that, again, we don't bump into each other or have a problem. Exactly. It keeps everybody separated no matter what the communication system might be. We could be in an MCON situation Mm -hmm. But these departure reference radials and all of these procedures that are established enables us to be able to keep everything zip-lit. Yeah. Because you can find a carrier based off the communications. If the enemy is out there listening, they know where to find us. Yeah. So that's why we try to do everything as quietly as possible. That's why all these procedures are in place to keep those comms down. All right, Sue. So, so again, on episode 15, we talked about the Marshall stack, but let's continue our scenario here where let's say I and my wingman are coming home now from our mission and it's case two. So again, we make our way through until we get to Marshall. And now what's different from the case one here with some weather that's going to impede our ability to recover a little bit. You're going to check in with Marshall about 50 to 60 miles out. Marshall is going to give you the case recovery. It's case two. They're going to give you Marshall instructions at that point. They're going to line you up on some radial that's 21 miles away from the ship at 6,000 feet. That's where the Marshall stack starts. Mm -hmm. If you're a flight of two, the second aircraft that checks in, not your wingman, but the second sortie to come back would go at 23 miles behind the ship at 8,000 feet. They do that in case there's a transition to case three, because whenever you're case two, there's a very good chance that you're going to transition to case three. That leaves 22 and seven vacant for your wingman to hop into that Marshall spot in the event the weather does go case three during that. The radial is off the tack end relative to the ship's heading. You usually are you know, behind the ship at that point, 21 and six. You're going to be given an expected approach time from Marshall. You're going to do your 
six minute left hand racetrack pattern, two minute legs, your inbound leg has to pass over the Marshall point. When you get your commence time, that's what we call it. You'll commence at the time that you are given. You want to hit that 21 and six spot. It's eight minutes from your ramp time, your expected ramp time of when you should be hitting the deck of the carrier. So you've commenced your approach. You're talking to Marshall. Marshall will follow you or watch you until you get to 10 miles. At that point, you'll report a see you. Hopefully. I see mom. Hopefully yeah. you have it. Right. And at that point, if you do see the carrier, you'll switch up button one, you'll go with the air boss and you will head in for the break, conduct your break, come run land, and hopefully you're hitting it at your exact ramp time. Well, and at that point, if you're not the first one to break the deck, then it really doesn't matter as long as you take the proper interval to target that, what, 45 to 60 seconds, I think, usually of recovery between aircraft. But the point is, is case one and three are like the great weather and the awful weather, most logical arrivals that we do. And case two is kind of a hybrid where we marshal like case three, although we can do it as a section. But then once we get below the clouds and we see the ship, now the rest of it's like a case one. We can still do it, generally speaking, zip lip. But if you're coming in and you just don't know where your interval is, you can always say, you know, at the stern, call my interval. You know, I would only do that if I just couldn't see anybody because I don't want to break in front of them. And the ship might say, the deck is yours, meaning you can break now or intervals three miles upwind, downwind. And now you know you've got to go way up to find that guy and break behind him to set yourself up to come in. So I would say case two is kind of challenging because we just don't do a lot of it based on the weather, like you said. We don't. It's for controllers, especially we prefer case three instead of doing case two. Just because you have control now of everything? We do. And there's nothing more fun than carrier traffic control. And the approach controller gets robbed of doing anything during case two. (laughs) And so does the final controller. (laughs) Uh, But you're all there just in case it goes down, right? Yes. And we'll talk about those people in a second. Fully staffed when it's case two. You have your full complement of controllers each position. All right, so now it's either complete dog squeeze weather or that's technical terminology, of course, mm-hmm. or it's nighttime. And no matter how good the moon is, which is almost never good except when we're in port, if it's nighttime, it is case three. So now again, I'm on the deck doing my ground operations, if you will, with no radio communications unless needed. But then once I shoot off, it's a different than a case one and case two type of flying I'm doing. And we don't necessarily need to talk about that. But again, right, I'm with departure. I tell them I'm airborne and now I'm under positive control right away. You are. You check in with departure as soon as you launch. You climb to about 1,500 feet, I think, to about five miles. And at seven miles, where you're going to turn to intercept your 10 mile arc to go out to your assigned departure radio. It's the same as case two. You're going to rendezvous between 20 and 50 miles out there on your assigned departure radio and wait for your squadron mates. And then departure is going to tell you to go button three. I don't remember the exact terminology that a pilot says when he's ready to go on mission, but then departure will tell you check in button three. Right. And departure also, they're the ones that are working with the tanker. The tanker will check sweet or sour. Can they give gas, not give gas? They do that all up button two overhead the ship with departure. A lot of times people forget about that tanker, but you guys go out on mission with your gas station. Mm Mm-hmm. If we don't have one of the big wing Air Force tankers going out on mission with you, hanging out overhead somewhere in country, it might be one of the Super Hornets that go with you. And that's all done on button two as well. So that's going on while the aircraft are departing. And that's, I think, true case one, two, or three, right? Is there's always going to be fuel airborne for reasons we talked about on episode five with Fitz. But also, if you need to go visit them for a drink before you recover for whatever reason, then generally you're going to switch over and be under that control. All right, so I go out, I do my mission. You mentioned earlier, by the way, just to interrupt myself, the buttons, I think not only is it a little quicker to say button two or three, but also then it allows a little bit of surreptitiousness or whatever, right? We're not just giving out the frequency, but if it's in the clear, probably our adversaries can find it and listen anyway. But if I'm going out on case three and I do my mission, now when I come back, I'm not gonna check in as a section. I'm gonna kiss off my wing and we're gonna, check in with Marshall as individuals. You'll check in as an individual. You're going to get all the same information that you got for case two, the ship's expected final bearing, which is 10 degrees off of the base recovery course. By the way, during case one, you're using base recovery course for landing and departing on the ship. For case three, you're using final bearing, 
which is just an extension of the landing area of the carrier. So you'll get your expected final bearing, you'll get the weather, you'll get the altimeter, and you're gonna get your marshal instructions, which are the same as in case two, starting at 21 miles behind the ship, 6,000 feet, 22 and seven, 23 and eight, and it just goes up until however many aircraft you have returning for that event. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, left-hand racetrack pattern, your inbound leg must pass over the marshal point, you're going to get an approach that's eight minutes from your ramp time, okay. the expected time that you're supposed to be on deck. So if the time is zero, zero that you need to be on deck, say at 1700, exactly. We just use the last two numbers in the hour in CATSI. Right. So if it's zero, zero that you need to be on deck, you're going to get an expected approach time of five, two. That's when you need to leave Marshall. Gotcha. You'll start that inbound and you're going to be flying either the CV one approach or the CV2 approach. And those are just the two different tack in approaches. CV1 approach is 21 and 6 behind the ship is where it starts. The CV2 approach is overhead the ship. That's the least desirable approach back to the ship. But sometimes you have space constraints because you're going to be over land. We can't be marshalling over land or hostile territories. You know, we're given a box that we're allowed to fly in overseas or We'll practice it when we're stateside out in the warning areas. The CV-2 is least desirable because there's a big blind spot when the aircraft are descending overhead the ship to go behind the ship because you still got to get back behind the ship mm -hmm. and you're doing your loop and your arc to intercept the final bearing. It's a little bit more varsity. <laughs> it's not flown very often, so it's varsity, I think, for the pilots to fly it, and it's definitely varsity for the controllers due to the blind spot. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, I'll tell you, Sue, 705 total landings, 269 at night, and probably 10 or 12 bolters for that matter. Five deployments over 25 years, and I never did a CV2. So really? I, you know, we talked about it a lot, just never did one. They were my least favorite. I think they were most everybody's least favorite. You yeah. didn't like it when the OOD boxed you into a spot where you had to do one. But you got to be flexible. You do. Okay. And then as far as the Marshall timing, I will tell you, of course, when you're just hanging out up there anyway, you just try to find entertainment and whatever you can. But I did take special pride in hitting the exact 0, 0.0 DME at the exact zero zero second um, that minute that I was supposed to push. And <laughs> even if you don't make it, right, like if you're a, a half a mile away, but your clock is ticking and you see it go, you just tell them you're commencing, even though you're not, because everyone else is listening and judging. <laughs> and of course, if you're late, you wait until after you started down and you say it, but you know, it's the little games we play. We knew that you guys didn't know. We knew when you were <laughs> we could tell we're looking at it. Of course. Yeah. But my buddy in, you know, 306 didn't know and he's listening over there. But speaking of that, Sue, here's one thing I always wondered. Now, maybe it doesn't matter these days where everything is pretty much a super Hornet, but go back to our earlier deployments where we had Tomcats and Hornets and Prowlers and Vikings. How do you guys decide or who decides but how and who do you decide who goes where in the stack? I, in my little Hornet, was generally down in the seven, eight, nine type of thousands of feet. And it seemed like the others were always up higher. You're right. Your Hornets are going to be your 22 and 7, 23 and 8, 23 and 9. The reason for that is gas. So in case the deck is not ready, we always had a sacrificial first. <laughs> so go back to those days on the John F. Kennedy when we had F-14s. We called it the sacrificial Tomcat. That was going to be your 21 and 6 person because if the deck was not ready, they're huge. They've got big gas tanks. They're fat with gas, so they can go around. They can be sent around the pattern again. Hornets, you guys have tiny little gas tanks and you have no gas when you come back. So that's why you were always second, third, fourth, fifth. And then you would put the rest of your Tomcats on top of them. Then your Prowlers, your poor E2, he's always last. He's got a <laughs> lot of gas. And you can't tank them anyway. You can't tank them. Well, anymore. in the old days, now you can. Not in the old days. You can now, but, and they're just slower. You try to have as many like aircraft anyway behind one another due to the approach speeds. Uh, if you've got a Hornet, coming up behind a prowler, you've got to get very fancy with your air traffic control because on the carrier, it's a complete math problem and you're watching it and you're watching the clock. That Hornet is going to eat up that prowler and likely get waved off because you've got to have that mile and a half separation of aircraft on the final bearing. So in a perfect world, we all push on time. We've all got this built-in separation and we march down like ants and we all recover and 
everyone's all fine and good. But you talked about the deck not being ready. Just what are a couple quick reasons why it might not be? I mean, shouldn't it be ready? Uh, what could cause it to not be? It should be ready, but there could be FOD, foreign object, mm -hmm. in the landing area that maybe fell off on a departure. Because when you're coming back, we just finished a launch. Right. You know, Marshall's commencing. They're finishing up the last aircraft leaving for the launch. So there could have been something that fell off an aircraft. It could be maybe an aircraft got stuck. They were launching off the waste cats. Maybe one got stuck or a jet blast deflector could be stuck in the up position. If it's on the waste cat, that would foul the landing area. A person could have run out there real quick. And then, you know, the boss screams, foul deck, wave off, wave off. Right. Could be any number of reasons, but it happens a lot. Well, or even just a simple suspend, right? If I'm on cat three or four on the waist, which is where we also need to land. And of course, again, this is all orchestrated. They try not to send the last aircraft off the waist, send it off the bow. But at any rate, if I forget to turn on my lights or don't move my rudders or they see a hydraulic leak or anything, there's all kinds of things that could bring the house of cards crumbling down. There is. Um, and they need time to wrap that waist, as they call it. Now, Sue, I meant to do this before, and I've quickly opened my logbook to see if I can figure it out. But in 2005, as you know, because the cameras were in our faces all the time, <laughs> we had some rather colorful events off the coast of Perth, Australia, you might remember. Oh, I do. Okay. So we're all coming down, right? And so some of us have trouble landing. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I certainly <laughs> did. And again, it's funny that it made it in the series where you were cheering for me. But if I bolter, are you going to send me back out to Marshall and, and like get a new assignment to hold and wait to come down? No. Uh, the approach controller is just going to put you back in the pattern. We're going to sequence you back in. In the Marshall stack, we build in natural holes. We build in a natural hole for that sacrificial in case they can't. And by natural hole, I mean, everybody's commencing one minute apart. Well, after about, uh, I think it was like six or seven aircraft, you would build in a minute hole there. And that was so if somebody had to go around in the first couple of aircraft, you automatically had a three mile hole to stick them in. So when you're vectoring them in, they're gonna be a mile and a half in front of and behind the aircraft where the hole is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you bolter and have to go around and the natural hole is not there, well, that's when approach gets to get fancy and they'll start what we call lagging. They'll vector an aircraft about 30 degrees to the right and then back to the left just to try to build some space. Or you might have to tell an aircraft to dirty up at 10 miles, which means put your landing gear down, perform your landing checks, slow down to your approach speed. That's the least preferred way, but it's a way that we can do it. <laughs> we build a hole for you. Yeah. There's no point in sending anybody back to Marshall. That's a lot of flying unnecessary. And of course I knew that, but we're just asking for the sake of it. All right, let's see. I think I found it. It looks like it was October 4th. And I wrote in my remarks section of my logbook, Red Air, this was like the type of flight I did, Red Air slash massive pitching deck. <laughs> And I have one red bolter, red is for night operations, one red arrest. And what's not depicted on there, because I didn't get credit for it, is the first approach where I missed the whole ship. But that was a pretty sporty night. All right. So you guys get pretty busy down there trying to work everybody in. And what should take, what, 10 or 12 minutes to land all these aircraft, I think that night took well over an hour, didn't it? It did. Gosh, I think it took a couple of hours. And then we had to launch a tanker because so many people were having to go around, which is the yeah. one thing you didn't want to do is put another aircraft in the air, but we were blue water ops at the time. There was no suitable divert landing field. Yeah. So we had no choice but to stick a tanker in the air for everybody. It took hours. I just remember it felt like a whole day. Well, we had pitching deck during the day too. <laughs> It was a very varsity night. No doubt about it. Well, I thought they did a decent job of chronicling that in the series. And so that was a lot of fun. Well, not really, but <laughs> it's over, so I can say so now. Okay, so we talked about the different procedures, but let's talk about some of the equipment you all are using down there. Obviously, we have standard VHF, UHF radios, and for the military, mostly everything is UHF. And we don't need to necessarily geek out on that. I mean, they built it into the aircraft and the carrier. But you might go to, let's say, an airport near you and see the big spinning red radar. Does the carrier obviously have something like that? And do you have your own for air traffic control? Or do you just kind of tie into like ship's defenses kind of thing? 
we do have that and we do have our own. On the carrier, we had uh, Spin 43. That was our primary air search radar. That was ours, Catsy's radar. Okay. Carrier control approaches radar. Our backup radar was Spin 49, which was CDC's primary radar. CDC is the Combat Direction Center? Yes, Combat okay. Direction Center's primary radar. But if we needed to switch to a backup because the 43 was just maybe too much weather, was cluttering it, or maybe it just went down for whatever reason, we could switch to the 49 as long as we asked combat, could we switch to it, make sure they weren't using it. They had a backup of, I think, Spin 48 they could switch to if we needed to use the 49. The point is there's always a primary and a couple backups when you're out in the middle of the ocean in a war fighting aircraft or machine of the carrier's size and significance. So we're not just going to have one thing and hope it doesn't fail. We're going to have redundancies. That's right. And I guess the new carriers now, the newer class, the port class, they're all going to a dual band radar, which is a phased array radar, much like what the spy radars from the cruisers Mm -hmm. had. That's what they have now. You know, it's collective of a surveillance air traffic control radar and a, and a defense radar. And then did you have a separate radar to help us do our mode one type approaches, ACLS? What was that stamp for? Automated carrier landing system. There you go. So I could theoretically couple my autopilot to a signal being sent by the ship and it would bring me all the way down and put me right in the wires. That's right. That was the spin 46 for the ACLS. Okay. And it had mode one capability, mode two and mode three. Mode one was a fully automated approach. Like you said, couple, you take your hands off, eat some chips, enjoy the ride down. Mode two was we would lock on to you, send your needles, and you would fly to those needles, the information that the spin 46 was sending your aircraft. Did you need to go up or down, left or right? And then mode three, if you just could not receive the needles for whatever reason, get the information in your cockpit, we could talk you down on a PAR approach, precision approach radar, where we're telling you turn left three degrees, right two degrees. You know, you're above glide slope, below glide slope, on glide slope. Yeah. Just like at a shore station, what you get, it's just a little different looking. Let me ask you about that because I always thought it was crazy that ashore, we did have PARs in F-18s, but not ILS, which allows you to just do it by yourself. Do you think it's because we have the personnel that need the training and we have the pilots that need to be able to be familiar with it in case they do it out of the ship? Or was the military just being cheap? Probably the military being cheap, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> well, the Air Force has ILS. At one point, I did know the history of why the air stations did not have ILS. When I was the facility officer in New Orleans... We did have an ILS. The Air Force bought it because that was a joint base. Ah, okay. The Air Force bought the ILS, so we had one there. So maybe not the military being cheap. Maybe it was just the Navy being cheap. But <laughs> when the carrier, you do have the ICLS, which is the equivalent of an ILS instrument landing system, but it's just the instrument carrier landing system. And that was the Spin 41, the bullseye. Right. CATSI cannot see what information it is transmitting to you, but we would ask you for a correlation check between the 46 and the 41. If you recall getting asked that quite a bit, because we always wanted to make sure that the bullseye was transmitting what it should. So we would want you to correlate the needles you were seeing from the 46 with what you were seeing with the bullseye. I think it was that same deployment. We had a few issues with our bullseye, not marrying up with our ACLS, the needles, and they flew texts from the United States to come out and tweak it because we didn't want to have an incident where a pilot was splitting the needles, as I called it. Mm -hmm. So we wanted the technicians from Pax River, the most experienced people on the spin 41 to come out and tweak that radar. If you were splitting the needles, you would have a good chance of hitting the round down the back of the ship, which did happen on the Reagan. I believe it was the Reagan that had that incident. Fortunately, I believe no one was hurt on that, but we were very cognizant of that issue. Well, and speaking of that, I know you were just joking, but on a mode one, you are not just sitting back eating chips, as you said. And I'll tell you, I never did a mode one, Sue, believe it or not. The reason was, is when I was a brand new pilot in VFA 86 on George Washington, our XO was Bill Sizemore. He became an admiral and we've had him on the show actually on a happy hour, which is a bonus for our Patreon supporters. I was watching his recovery one night. It was a mode one. He was coupled up and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, it pitched him up in close and then nosed him over and he was Johnny on the spot. So were the LSOs who waved him off immediately. And you might think they would get a little lackadaisical because it's a mode one, but everybody was on the ball. He clicked out 
grabbed the stick, full military, actually afterburner power, and then had the presence of mind as he was pulling back to then push the nose forward so he didn't hit the back of the ship. So he's kind of, you know, porpoising up the angle. And then (laughs) I wasn't out on the uh, platform. I'm not an LSO. You know, normally you climb to 1,200 feet and turn downward. They saw his afterburner plumes just going up into eternity. He was so scared. Don't blame him. I would be too. It turns out they said, all right, no more mode ones. They brought the uh, carrier test suit guys out from Pax River and they did a couple tests and they said, yeah, something screwed up. We were on deployment. And they said, don't do any more mode ones until you get back. But, you know, if he had been enjoying the sights, it might have been a much fiery, uh, less happy ending. Absolutely. It was my experience on the carriers, too, that the only folks that would really fly mode ones were your very, very senior aviators. Maybe Mm -hmm. a squadron CO or CAG would fly mode ones because had to make sure the system was working. So we had to ask people to do it. But usually the only takers where you're very senior guys. Yeah. You would see maybe department heads do it if it was towards the end of the line period and they had a good streak of okay passes going and they didn't want to fall out of the top 10. <laughs> so to protect the GPA, I think was another reason. I just never did it because when we watched that, that just scared me to death. And I thought, I just want to always swing the weighted bat. You know, I just want to be ready all the time. So I'm just going to do it every time. And I was very blue collar, as I've talked about before on the show. Moving on. So we talked about the radar. What about the rest of the equipment you all use? So in the old days, you could sit in the ready room and there would be a particular TV channel where we could see a little Ouija board of the ship and the case three arrival and these little numbered pieces of paper, it looked like would like move. And every once in a while, a hand would come in from the side and move it forward. And then later that got digitalized. And then there was also these grease boards where we had to teach people to write backwards because they were on one side of the room. And the grease boards were giving information to people on the other side of the room. Those are my favorite things that you're talking about um, (laughs) as far as Catsy. Back when I was a controller at Giant Killer, Fax Fact Bay Capes, I got the opportunity to go out to the USS George Washington to the Catsy as an airspace representative. Because towards the end of a deployment, because they haven't been back for a while, they need to be briefed on any changes within the airspace. So I got to go. Females were not on carriers yet at this time, not as ship's company. They might come out as a COD pilot or something like that. So the board that you're talking about with the little pucks that you would watch that looked like the arrival pattern, that's the visual display board or VDB, as we call it. Okay. And there was a camera and it was painted in fluorescent paint and there was a black light in Cassie or the blue lights as we call them, which will make things glow. Usually the person would wear a white glove to move the pucks and it had the aircraft side number and it shows which aircraft is where like three zero four is at three miles. And that person would watch the approach controller a and approach controller B's scope or console and move the pucks as the aircraft moved on the radar scope. If they bolted, you'd put it in front of them. One thing about VDB is no matter what, no matter where those airplanes are in reality, they were always two miles apart on that visual display board. Reason being is because you would hear "Eh, eh," and Catsy if they were any closer and the commanding officer was calling down to the Catsy officer to tell them to get those aircraft separated to two miles. (laughs) So in other words, this has nothing to do with reality. It's just the way it's depicted on the board. That's it. And I got to do visual display board when I was on the George Washington and being a part of Catsy, that was always like an elite air traffic control. So when girls got to go or females got to go, I was very, very excited and volunteered right away to be part of it. And when I got to go TAD and do the visual display board, I was in high cotton. I couldn't have been more excited. (laughs) Although I did not wear the white glove and I did have painted nails. The captain did call down and ask the Catsy officer, Commander Rick Hostetler was his name, does your visual display board have painted nails? He did not know it was a female doing it. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. This was a transitory time in the Navy. But yeah, for that reason, we used to call, again, in the ready rooms, all we would see is that camera view. So it was top down, but from us, it was on the side, like a regular TV is mounted. And you just see this little hand sneak in from the side. And so we called that display, Mr. Hand. Mr. Hands. We didn't know once in a while it was Mrs. Hand or Miss Hand, I guess, but. I think still called Mr. Hands, even though it's computerized now. 
it's not a feed off of the actual radar. It's still a person clicking the computer mouse, moving it around the same okay. general concept as much as most COs and air bosses would love to see it somehow get a feed off of the radar. Most people that are in Catsy are very opposed to that. <laughs> they don't want them seeing the real picture. <laughs> Old habits die hard, I guess. Well, right. yeah. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. It's the, uh, we don't, our reality out there. Oh boy. Yeah. All right. I assume we spent weeks or maybe months teaching airmen and sailors how to write backwards on grease boards, but that seems like a really just odd Navy, again, relic from way back when. Way back when. <laughs> when I was on the John F. Kennedy, when I got to be ship's company, I started out on the stat boards, as we called it, and it's a piece of plexiglass that's got tape on it. And so you write the aircraft side number, the pilot name, his fuel state, what button they're going to be on. And you got about a week maybe to learn how to write backwards. When you would go to carrier air traffic control school, you would learn it there and you would go home after school or go back to your barracks or hotel, wherever it was that you were. And you would practice on notebook paper, writing backwards until you were very proficient at it. And some people are amazingly proficient at it very, very fast. Mm -hmm. When I was marshal controller on the Kennedy I had this one stat board writer, Andy, he was phenomenal. He was very fast, very proficient, never missed a fuel state, anything. And I would give him what we called case three candy after the evening because he was so good, you know, kind of a reward system. It's amazing how some people, and after flight ops, we used to stand behind the stat boards and entertain one another, put on little shows, act like you're walking down the stairs. It looks like you're going downstairs it's what you do when you're bored right like you sit in the ready room and do stuff we would do the same thing in catsy yeah because there was a camera on those stat boards so the ready rooms air boss the bridge they could all see that information it's all computerized now it's the isis the integrated shipboard information system and think is what it stands for mm -hmm. it's a person on a computer just punching in the information and they just get a repeater feed in the ready rooms and everywhere else but it was a lot of fun when it was humans back then <laughs> <laughs> well, and every once in a while, you know, O's and T's and A's are easy, but you would see a backwards S from our point of view on the other side. And so I imagine they take to it fairly quickly. And then of course they go to write a letter home and they might accidentally put a backward S or something, but that does happen. Well, so who are these people? So right when the carrier and air wing get together, the air wing brings their aircraft and maintainers and pilots and everybody else. But everyone that you worked with in Catsy, I assume was all part of the ship's company. We were. All of them are air traffic controllers, to include the folks that work in air ops. They're air traffic controllers, and they belong to the ship, their ship's company. And so was that what you did when you first came in, and so you worked your way up through all those different positions and ranks? I did. I started out in air ops. That's usually where your most junior air traffic controllers go because they don't have a lot of experience. Or if you were someone like me, I was an E-5 when I went to the Kennedy. I had air traffic control experience, but I didn't have shipboard experience. So you start them in air ops to where they'll learn basically the day-to-day -day functions of CATSI, because CATSI, again, is CCA, Carrier Control Approach, and Air Ops together. So that's what comprises the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center. Your Air Ops person, you have an Air Ops supervisor who's assisting the Air Ops officer in basically the administrative functions, flight planning, if you will. You have a ship's plotter, and that's a person that there's an old school map under a piece of plexiglass and they use a grease pencil and they plot the ship's position on that map. In the event the ship loses power, we need to know where the last position was of the ship. They still do that, I believe, to this day. So that you have that to work from. And then you have your stat board writers or your ISIS operators, as they're called now. Okay. They're tracking all the fuel states and things like that because the air ops officer decides who needs to go get fuel. So they're doing that for the air ops officer. So when a young enlisted man or woman comes in, they can expect obviously boot camp and then some A and C schools to become experts at air traffic control. And then will their career path be sort of alternating a lot like the rest of the Navy between sea and shore billets? So they might go out on a carrier and then they might come back, what, and be assigned to an air station? Yes. Or it could be vice versa. They could go to an air station first and then a carrier. It's just mm -hmm. where they're needed or an amphib ship. Okay. They have controllers on the amphibious ships. I never did an amphibious tour. I only did the carriers, but you can do both. You can be a carrier sailor and then maybe the next sea duty that's available for you when it's your turn to go to sea again, it might be an amphibious ship or it could be a TACRON 
which is a squadron of air traffic controllers that deploys with the amphibious ship with, I believe their purpose is to be able to go on land like the Marines and establish an airfield over in whatever land okay. there is. There's only so many spots on the ships for air traffic controllers. The division is about 40 people large, and I don't know what it is on an amphib ship. So you might do a few back-to-back shore tours. That's very common. Okay. There have been people who have done their entire 20-year career without ever going to the ship. Maybe wow. the timing just didn't work out for them to where a ship was available, and they've done all shore stations. So the 40 people you're talking about, we're talking here like approach and departure and marshal even though you work so closely with the tower, the folks on the flight deck, directors and things like that. So it's a team, but it's a smaller unit for the air traffic control folks. Yes. Now, that being said, at the beginning of that part, I did delineate between ship's company and the air wing. But as I remember, as a JO, I used to have to go up to the tower for case one operations and that as a department head, because they want the more experienced folks there, I had to go down to Catsy for case three. So we have air wing reps as well, right? Yes, you do. Those guys are there to assist in the event an aircraft's in marshal and they've got an issue and they want to troubleshoot it or they just have something they need to talk to the wing rep. That person is there so they can immediately be readily available on the radio. Gotcha. I believe in case three, they would sit out in air ops on the bleachers, as we called them. Each Mm -hmm. person had an assigned seat out there. They would sit on the bleachers. And if 304 needed to talk to you, Jello, the air ops officer would call back and say, I'm sending Jello back. And we would hand you the radio and you could talk to the aircraft. Right. Or I think they also had a radio in air ops as well. The little handheld on the wall there that you could talk to him. Yeah. Normally they would just yell, you know, strike rep or, you know, whatever your call sign was, Warhawk rep. Oh uh, yeah, I'm right. You know, I'm here because you're back there watching and listening, and you're being available. And that could be handy also in case there's a question, like particularly if someone bolters, like, "Hey, what's going on with the fuel state? Oh, they were doing this mission." If you happen to know, but you can provide little inside information on, "Oh yeah, that's pilot so and so, and he's been uh, struggling with boltering lately or something." So there's some information the rep can offer. Usually though, especially when you go up to the tower, you're just sort of a punching bag for the air boss. <laughs> <laughs> ideally you go up there you don't say anything nobody says anything to you and you go down and <laughs> you're all set all right cool sue well we've been at this for a while i've just got a couple listener questions i want to throw at you if i can some of them i think we've already covered are you game i am game all right so sven weber says is air traffic control for operations near the carrier or only or does it cast a wider net now you talked about the 50 mile ring sue but sven goes on Does it sometimes mesh with civilian ATC when the carrier is underway or close to foreign coastlines, like to reserve airspace for training or announce Navy aircraft in transit? So there's a couple of different parts of this question. Let's start with, do you coordinate with other air traffic control when you might be close to land? We do. We coordinate for off the coast of the United States, whether it be Giant Killer on the East Coast or Beaver on the West Coast, we do coordinate with the facts facts. We don't do any coordination with like your NAS Lamar or NAS Oceana. Right. We just coordinate with the facts facts. We don't do any coordination with the civilian centers at all. If any coordination were to need to be done, it would be with the facts back and they could coordinate with the like New York center or wherever, but we don't really interface with any shore air traffic control. We have had meetings when I was on the Kennedy, I flew off to, I think it was Oman, and we did have a meeting about airspace. Hmm. It was the CATSI officer. I was the marshal controller at the time, CATSI officer, the CATSI chief, and myself to build our boxes of what we were going to fly in, but not a whole lot at all of okay. coordination with outside entities. So the air ops is probably the main responsibility for deconflicting, making sure we're not near civilian air routes or near some super dense airspace, and you're basically handling just the ATC portions around the carrier. Correct. All right. Next question is from John Clark. And there's another question after him from Jim Gundog that are kind of related, but John starts with Sue is such a great cheerleader for the air crews in that PBS special. And as we just learned, you do a whole lot more than just cheer us on. But regardless, he says, how did Sue train and mentor other CATSI controllers? And then Jim Gundog's question related to that is what issues do new controllers have and about how long does it take a new guy or gal out of A school before they are, quote, trusted 
to be a solid controller. So I'm guessing there's only so much you can learn academically and then a lot of OJT happens, right? But did you have a, obviously received some of that when you were enlisted and hopefully gave some of that as an LDO? I did. Air traffic control is a lot of OJTI. When you come out of A school, you're not qualified as an air traffic controller. You have that rating, but you're not qualified on those positions. You have to train on each position, whether it's plotter or whether it's approach control. You have an OJTI instructor. I had plenty of instructors during my time, and I was an instructor for a long time, always, I guess, throughout my career, especially (laughs) as a facility officer or as a CATSI officer. As an air traffic control officer, the closest you are to air traffic control, still wearing a headset and everything is on the carrier. And you're kind of overall OJTI instructing. When aircraft weren't flying, we did a lot of scenarios, did a lot of training. I would take my experiences, Senior Chief Wood would take her experiences and pass those on and help train those junior controllers. We'd talk about our career. We would help them with their career path. What did they want to do? Did they want to get out and go to the FAA? We wish them all the best of luck. Do they want to stay in the Navy? Do they want to be an LDO? Do they want to be a chief? What are their goals? And I spent a lot of time trying to mentor the junior sailors with whatever path they wanted to go. If it was FAA, I would contact an FAA buddy of mine and ask them to talk to that person, mentor, make sure that's what they wanted to do. Is that a fairly, like for a pilot getting out like I did and going to the airlines? I mean, there's some work to do, but it's not insurmountable. Is that fairly common for the folks that you work with to go to the FAA? It's very common. Either they'll go to the FAA or if they're too old, like I was, they could go to a contract tower and work. Like a lot of airports like Charlottesville, you would think those are all FAA controllers, but they're not. They're contract controllers. They work for companies. They can tell you you're too old. Oh, yeah. You're too old to go. I think at the age of 32 really? to go to the FAA. I, I can't remember. <laughs> 31, 32. So. Don't you just have to be able to pay attention to what's happening and speak and listen? As long as you're under the age of 32 and doing that, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, 32 is old and washed up to be a controller in the FAA. Wow. Don't I feel old? All right. And you make a good point about the other things you do, right? When you're a team of 40 on a ship at sea, I have to think you're. I don't want to say wiping noses, right? But you're dealing with the things that are going on at home and their advancement exams and who's upset about this or that or the other thing. So you become a family. It's such a tight, close knit environment. I mean, you are a family. You know what people like to eat. You know their habits. You know things about their families. You are there with them for the good, the bad. You know, their kids are graduating high school and they're out at sea. You're celebrating with them, but you're sad for them at the same time or They might sadly, unfortunately, lose a family member. You're there to console them and you grieve with them. I mean, it's very, very tight. On the 05 cruise on Nimitz, were you the only air traffic control officer? Because you mentioned a senior chief. I was the only officer. And then I had uh, Senior Chief Sarah Jane Wood. We had uh, some chiefs. I had Chief Stokes. He made chief on appointment. I guess the question I'm getting at is, what if you eat the fish at dinner and now you're in the bathroom instead of in the catsy. I mean, you're one deep. Are the people all trained to hopefully be able to cover each other? They are. Sarah Jane was qualified as a catsy watch officer. It's a PQS position. I had first class petty officers that were qualified as catsy watch officer. They have to be fully catsy qualified. They have to be the catsy supervisor qualification. But if they displayed the maturity and the ability to get their PQS signed off and earn the CATSI watch officer qualification. They did. There's yeah. no pay grade. That's I'm billeted in there as the CATSI officer, right. but to sit that position, if I ate the fish, I usually don't eat fish. So I probably would be <laughs> in the bathroom and not available for CATSI, but Sierra chief could stand in for me at any time as well as AC one Garcia. He could as well too. PQS was personnel qualification, qualification standard. standard. Okay. I was going to say system, but in other words, Someone has identified, here's all the things you need to be able to document your skill at. And once you've got them all signed off, it's a qualification, but it's also sort of a feather in the cap when it comes time for evaluations, right? It sure is. That first class can say, hey, I'm a qualified such and such. It is. And to answer the other part of the question of what obstacles, I can't remember exactly what the question was that he had. Uh, What issues do new controllers have? I'm not really sure. Like I've been out of air traffic control now since 2017. That's not too long ago, but I'm not really sure what new issues 
would be out there for a new controller. I didn't want to ignore his question, but I just really don't know. Like when someone came to you in 05, let's say you had a new controller show up in the middle of cruise right out of A school, what kind of issues might that person have? It could be the first time that they're really away from home or that far away from home. And sometimes they have trouble adjusting to that, or it could be even if they were a little bit more seasoned, if it's their first time out at sea, they have trouble adjusting. It's a very fast paced, unforgiving environment when there's a big difference between have an aircraft a mile and a half apart, going to the landing area and being three miles apart, like on shore. It could be a big learning curve. The pressure of the carrier environment compared to the pressure of a shore environment, the gap is huge and someone might not be able to adjust as well. So you got to help them work through that, help them find a way to be comfortable with it and understand it. Also, you got to have a lot of thick skin because <laughs> So, oh yeah, a lot of language and yelling and things that happen in there. So <laughs> it's all adults. So it should all be all right. So Sue, I've got two more questions. This next one is a fun one. Michael wants to know, and I hope the answer is no. Were there any bets on pilots who will have how many bolters? No, never. Of course not. Yes, no. <laughs> always. There was always. Uh, well, if someone really? tended to bolter more than others, you would see their name up on the board and. You know, kind of make a little wager. Like, how many times do you think they're going to go around tonight or gas up the tank or so and so is flying? Did the over under like change? I mean, if the deck is pitching and all bets are off, I would think. But yeah, I mean, even on a steady night, I was not necessarily one to miss the wires from time to time. It happens. It's, it happens. Hook skips. I mean, well, I don't want to know if you had bets on Ayala. That... I do not recall any, honestly. Right. Don't that recall any sense. on you, so we'll say no. <laughs> all right. And then this last one is a little off topic, but just for fun. Jevin wants to know your thoughts on the recent F-35C crash on Carl Vinson, as well as the leaks of the photos and video. And again, to be clear, at that point, right, the LSOs have complete control. You guys are manning your equipment, but you're not really involved. So as much as you're willing to opine, if you will, on the crash and what you saw, if you in fact saw it. I did not see it. I did not look at the photos and videos. I did hear about it when it happened. I did read the news article, but I generally typically sometimes don't look at pictures of crashes and things because I don't know what exactly mm. you're going to see and they can be a little hard to look at, but not having been out there, I don't know what happened in that scenario as much. So I do know what it's like when there's a crash on the flight deck from when I was on the Kennedy. So I can envision what things were going on and what was going through folks head. But in that particular instance, I don't really have an opinion. And speaking of that, so we have on this show, although we've not done a full up like safety type show where we talk about the boards and everything, but we've touched around the different topics. But if there's a mishap, it's possible you guys might have to be interviewed for the mishap board, right? Yes. I was interviewed when I was on the Kennedy when we had the mishap, even though it was case one, it was a carrier qualification for the students from Pensacola in the T-45s because we're still manned up in Catsy. We're still there. Right. And I was the case one supervisor. We're listening to all the transmissions on button one so that if the boss needs any assistance or if anything is going on, like I said, we're there as backup. And so we were all who was working case one in air ops and CCA interviewed by the mishap board had to provide our, we call them tapes, the video recordings mm -hmm. of the radar, as well as the voice transmissions. Yeah. I think I've seen footage of that. It's a bolter and he's got a bit of a right drift. Yeah. Yeah, he had popped a tire on oh, is that what it was? the departure. It was his last trap. He had nailed every one of them, and that was his last one for qualification, but he had popped the tire. Oh. And so that was going to cause that pull to the left. I think it was with the LSO that was talking to him did a, I think, a phenomenal job at, at giving him the instructions of what to expect and what oh. to do. But, you know, things sometimes just work out or happen a certain way, but... It's dangerous business for sure. So no Sue, I've already taken a lot more of your time than I said I would. So wrapping up, anything I didn't ask you about CATSI, which did we even say what CATSI means? Carrier Air Traffic Control Center? That's right. That's what it stands for. What else about CATSI or air traffic control around carriers? It is the most fun air traffic control that's out there. You know, I remember as a junior sailor, all the guys that were part of CATSI and then they would come to the shore station and they were just looked upon as you know, it was an elite fraternity because not everybody could do it. Yeah. And they would let you know that it was so I couldn't, wait. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get there, but it was more or less just to shut them up. You know, <laughs> it is so 
fun. You know, air traffic control is fun anyway. It is stressful, but on the carrier, it's just unique. I love it. It's a lot of fun. It's also the only, what I feel like is the only air traffic control environment where you're interfacing every day with the pilots that you're talking to. You could be on a shore station for five years, three to five years, and never ever see the face of the person that you're talking to. That's right. But on the carrier, even the enlisted controllers are seeing y'all every single day. They get to know you. So it's a bond in that air traffic controller pilot relationship that's very deep. You look at the pilots differently. You look at the planes differently on that radar scope when you're talking to them. The guys be like, oh, that's Jello." you know? It just puts a different face on it. I always enjoyed hearing your voice, Sue. Because I was usually giving somebody a penalty box. <laughs> no, but yours was distinct, right? Because uh, it was a female voice and a lot of the male voices I couldn't discern, but I could always tell when it was you. So, All right, well, what's the future hold? I mean, you're down there in Orlando. Are you retired? Just you know, sitting on the rocking chair or what's going on? Sitting by the pool every day. No, I wish. I, I'm i still working. I'm working as a government contractor, and I'll do this for a few more years, and then, I don't know, maybe go hand out towels at one of the fancy resorts here or something uh, in Orlando. I, I love living down here, but it's like being on vacation every day, so I'd like to be on vacation every day. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then we always wrap up with call signs. And honestly, I just know you as Catsy Sue. And I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But was that from 05 or did you ever have anything else you went by? No, not really. Uh, you know, my name is Susan, but everybody has always shortened it to Sue in the Navy. And mm-hmm. when I got to the Nimitz, the air boss there, when he would call down the Catsy on the Satsy, he would always say, Catsy Sue, how do you do? So he made up that little rhyme and it stuck. <laughs> well, when you're on a ship, Things that seem ridiculous now seem okay because you're just in this weird world. So it is. All right. Well, Sue, you know how I want to finish is, and I hope this doesn't get awkward suddenly, but it's the way we finished most days on the Nimitz in 05. Do you remember this? You and I shared a wall on the O2 level. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And your bunk was on the other side of the wall from mine. And so while it's not like living here in Coronado where I do, where I can hear my neighbor's phone ringing, I could sort of hear if you guys were over there. And so one of us invariably at the end of the night would bang on the wall and say, good night, Sue, and good night, Jello. So we did. (laughs) We did. You could hear really decently well through those walls. They're they're just a thin piece of metal. Do you remember, by the way, my mother coming out on Tiger Cruise? I've got a picture of her hugging you. I think you two really hit it off. I do remember your mom. I loved her. She's a sweet lady. Well, if this episode airs when I think it does, she is turning 80 uh, less than a week later. What? Happy birthday to your mom. Thank you very much. That's exciting. And I, I be, yeah, we're going to get the whole family together up there and celebrate. Well, Good night, Sue. Uh, This is a lot of fun. I really want to thank you for explaining Catsy and air traffic control operations around the ship. Good night, Jello. It was my pleasure. It was great seeing you again. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Happy birthday, Mom. Love you.